Hello, my name is Tanya Kiri Part from TED. We have a killer panel here today to talk about extreme sports. Where is the limit of human potential? Joining me, I'm super excited to have uh, Annabelle Punter, Chris Cooley, Sports Illustrated reporter and author, David Epstein. And via Skype, we have MLB maven, Doug Glanville, and two Winter Olympiads, ice hockey maven, Haley Wickenheiser, and uh, Bob Slater, Steve Messler. So, so glad to have you guys here today. Let's kick it off to David. What is the big question that's uh, on your mind right now when it comes to the landscape of extreme sports? Um, actually, let me just point out also, I think Haley Wickenheiser is also a summer Olympian, one of the rare oh, summer and winter all Olympians, right. um, softball and um, <laughs> hockey. But actually, what I would love to hear from this group, because uh, they represent a really diverse array of sports, you know, two major sports uh, in America and, and gold medalists, what, over the course of their career, was the single biggest change they saw in their sport, whether it was something technology driven or, or culture driven and what they think it, it will be for um, the next 10 years, anything, whether it's training, whether it's equipment um, or, or just the way that teams and, and coaches sort of um, interact. I guess since Chris is here, maybe yeah. Chris can start. Yeah, it's, um, yeah we, were, we were actually, I, I think, talking about this and, and the thing that I've seen in football is really this embracing of advanced metrics, this idea that they saw what happened with baseball with Sabre metrics and they said, you can win more games if you know which stats are pertinent. And so there's really this drive to figure out, okay, which stats matter and how do we take advantage of, of them? And as a player, I've seen that in meetings. It's, it's evolved over when I first got into to when I, I, I left is that now all of a sudden teams are showing charts and graphs with you know, turnover ratio percentages, what that does to your odds of winning the game, what giving up a big play does to your odds, um, you know, what, what time of possession does to your odds, and really trying to make players aware that this is important information. And do players do players take it um, really seriously in meetings, or does it take some kind of? A uh, it's kind of. I mean, some guys do, some guys don't. It's it's really once you start hammering it home over and over and over again, you know, guys guys kind of pick it up. But that that also has to be something that's taught in schools is the idea that statistics do matter. And yeah, it doesn't predict individual cases, but over time, these stats will definitely predict what you're going to do. You mentioned that MLB um, paved the way into that. Doug, what are your thoughts here? Well, oh, hey, Chris, by the way, big fan. Saw your compensation. Oh, thanks. Uh, on ESPN, outstanding. But um, there's no doubt in baseball, the sabermetrics world has taken over. Uh, how they evaluate talent, how they look at player performance. It's a whole different culture. I finished in 2005, and, and even since that time as an analyst now, I see how players are evaluated. I even look at my own career differently because my on-base percentage wasn't that high when I played. I'd probably been an extra player right out of the gate. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a new look. And I think that culture uh, kind of spawned after, especially after the whole PED factor, which is certainly part of this conversation, mm -hmm. that I watched 1998, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, this whole revolution towards the power game and how uh, these statistics were sort of uh, seen in terms of evaluating performance and there's no doubt that I was a center fielder that wasn't a home run hitter and very quickly my role became much more geared towards being a fourth outfielder off the bench because now center fielders were expected to hit 25 to 35 home runs so I think that cultural shift uh, sort of reflected a new generation of athlete in baseball and I, it sort of followed a five-year cycle of change so certainly the cultural aspect between I would say PEDs and also this factor of, of Sabre metrics completely changed the game. Cool. So maybe we can ask um, uh, Steve if you want to say what, what was the biggest change you saw. So Steve was, it, was a decathlete who then became a gold medalist um, in the bobsled, as many bobsledders are often sort of multi-sport athletes before. If you can say what was the biggest change you saw over your, your time. Because yeah, how many, how many, when did your Olympic career start? Uh, my Olympic career started in 2002. So I mean, I was, I came in when the U.S. hadn't won a medal in, in four-man bobsled in what well, it was at that point I think 48 years they hadn't won any kind of medal uh, and in 2002 the guys went silver and bronze uh, and then in 2010 we won the first gold in 62 years and I think for me the biggest difference was technology so these guys were just talking about you know the athletes and changing in training and changing in and changing in peds I mean peds was always a big change for me my first year in the sport in 2001-2002 there were four Americans that tested positive 
plus a couple foreigners, um, I think that was more more Americans tested positive in my first year in the sport than through the rest of the nine or ten years I was in it. So it definitely cleaned up. So on that side of things, it got better. Uh, but for us, it was technology. Uh, we were investing more in wind tunnels. We were investing more in digitization. So all of a sudden, we were able to look at the details that we kind of, the American system, hadn't really looked at before. So, you know, one thing, Dave, you talk about is that's one thing that's changed in sport is technology. And in bobsleigh, that's been it. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you know, between, you know, BMW getting involved, you know, people who, who've made cars for generations are now helping build bobsleds. That's been the biggest shift where we're now we're seeing sleds go faster and we're seeing the Americans get better and faster. And it's due to due to a lot of it's the technology infrastructure that we've invested in. That's right. The guy who built the chassis, I guess, for the for the sled that you won the gold medal in was a NASCAR, Jeff Bodine's engineer, right? Um, yeah, the Bodine project. The, the Bodine project has been, uh, you know, Jeff in 1993 or 1994 saw Americans using Swiss made sleds and German made sleds, and obviously we were getting the cast off sleds. So Jeff decided that he would bring his NASCAR guys in, and it took them about 15 years to get it right. Uh, that's about how long it took them to actually put something together that would that could win a gold medal. Cool. And uh, so Haley, I want to hear the, the same from you, but also I think I can't remember exactly the league, but I know you've played a little bit of in, in a men's professional league hockey um, at some point. Yes. And yes. Um, there, you know, there, there's always sort of I, I think sports fans naturally sort of compare. They look at women and say, well, could this woman play? Um, you know, in a men's league, and, and sometimes I wonder if that sort of devalues some of the accomplishments of female athletes on their own, but it's sort of this natural comparison people want to make. And so, in addition to, to saying how your sport has changed, I'd also be interested to hear how, what that experience was like for you and um, whether uh, you, you think other women might give it a try in hockey in the near future. For sure. I mean, I agree uh, along the same lines as everyone else in the sense that, you know, technology has come a long way, and in the sport of hockey, which is such a team sport, um, the use of video and analysis, and even in real time, like during a game, um, you know, there's a, usually an eye in the sky that's talking down to the bench, similar as they would use in football. Um, but we're using that more and more in hockey. And not only that, I think individual players have really uh, taken it upon themselves to do a lot of video work, watching, say, your own shifts and evaluating yourself, trying to pick apart maybe another team's defenseman or opposition and figure out how you can win the little battles within the game of hockey that ultimately help you win the big game. So that's a big transition from when I first started, let's say, in the national team in uh, 20 years ago. I think the other thing in women's hockey, which relates to your point about um, men's Pro hockey is just the quality of player that we have now, the quality of athlete that we have now, just as the sport has evolved, um, you know, the training, the physical training, um, every girl that's coming into hockey at a young age is getting a chance to start at five or six versus 12, 13. So that's really helped to grow the game a lot and make it progress. Uh, as far as the pro side of things, uh, I was able to play in the first and second divisions in Finland and Sweden at a pretty high level of men's hockey and um, I did it because I wanted to uh, develop myself as a player and get out of my comfort zone and try to uh take my own game to the next level and um, I think you know we've seen other goaltenders uh, my own our own goaltender Shannon Zabados from our Olympic team this year is playing uh, in the Southern Professional League for the Columbus uh, team and um, we've seen men all right other goalies in the past I would say that I don't know if you really want to compare it is a little bit difficult um, I don't know that we'll see a lot of female athletes uh, female hockey players be able to do that. There's a lot of factors involved, and uh, hopefully, ultimately, at the end of the day, the best thing I think for women's hockey would be to have a, a WNHL league that uh, would have professional hockey for women. Cool. Can I ask another yeah, question? Yeah, oh, Absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to hop in. Just as Haley had talked about, you know, where athletes are starting, the girls are starting to play younger. Uh, and the athletes have changed. And you know, on the female side, we've actually seen that happen a lot this year. As a lot of people know, uh, there was somebody who maybe some people may or may not have heard of, named Lolo Jones, who came out and really helped elevate uh, the, you know, the credential that is the female bobsledder. And you had a Lauren Williams who went out and won a silver medal in her first year in the sport. So on the female side, the the, the actual athletes have changed. I mean, Herschel, Herschel Walker and Willie Galt came out in the 90s to do bobsled, and, and since then the bar has kind of stayed. I mean, those guys weren't heads and tails better than everybody else, but then you have a Lolo and a Lauren come out, and in their first or, you know, couple of years in the sport, all of a sudden they're dominating uh, and winning Olympic medals. So that's definitely been a big shift for us to see the quality of athletes, especially on the female side, really start to raise. 
So there's some kind of athlete selection still going on, in, in, especially in sports, I guess, that not as many people have access to in sort of an easy way, right? There's that yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got football, baseball, and hockey on here. You've got three of the four major sports in, in North America. And then you've got the fringe sports like bobsled where, you know, we inherit football players who either couldn't catch a, couldn't catch a ball, couldn't take a hit, or couldn't run a pattern. Uh, or we have track athletes like me who, you know, just couldn't stay healthy doing certain events. Um, so there's definitely an evolution. But again, on the men's side, that evolution is kind of stalled for the last 15 or 20 years. There's a high level of athlete. But on the women's side, it's still, I mean, 2002 was the first time they ever did women's bobsled in the Olympic Games. So it's still at that huge growth curve. Gotcha. So obviously this conference is a lot about innovation and change. And so I'm sort of curious to hear if each one of you were like king of your sport for a day from youth to the pros and could make any change to the sport, including the pipeline or the fan experience or whatever, what, what that would be. And, and I'd love to hear from Doug first on that. Um, well, well, you know, I think a lot about youth sports. It, it sort of Haley brought that point up about this early specialization. And, I, and I'm sort of, on one end, it's exciting that kids now can start at like five years old, play baseball, and they play 24 hours, they play around the clock. But I think the flip side is creates certain concern about that sort of one-dimensional hyper-focus where you don't have this balance. So I, I would try to add more balance and exposure to players and athletes that are student athletes just trying to learn the different attributes and strengths and weaknesses of all these sports. It, it's, it's concerning to me at times, first of all, the amount of money and investment that it requires for some uh, young people to try to play a sport, a travel club, they need certain spikes, they have alternate uniforms. I mean, you know, there's a lot of serious investment going on to sort of capture these, this young market. But of course, as you've recognized with these great athletes I'm sitting on this panel with, the large majority don't have this opportunity to play at that next level. And if, is that seen as a failure? You hate to see that perceived as, as failure if you're not able to play professionally. You want people to enjoy the sport inherently and have a passion for just athleticism and, and all the gains you can have from, from competitive access. So that's what I would change. It's, it's not specific necessarily to baseball, but uh, you know, sort of getting back to that organic, you know, natural form where you can just celebrate sport. Do you feel the same way, Chris, in terms of like moving from like, you know, baseball and football is sort of America's favorite pastime mm -hmm. sport. Um, the early stage specialization, is that, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Um, I, I think it's not necessarily a great thing simply because I played soccer and baseball growing up. I never played football until high school. And, you know, I, what that did was it allowed me to develop an athletic background. It allowed me to learn how to control my body, how to move around. And... That, that is what you want as an athlete because then you can start learning the fundamentals of everything else and start applying that to specifics and be like, okay, I've learned how to kick a soccer ball. I've learned how to move my body in baseball running. You know, I've learned how to dive as a goalkeeper. Now I can transfer that to kicking a football. Now I can transfer that to moving around on a football field. And uh, you know, I, I think having a broader array of athletic pursuits also makes you more aware that the world isn't just one sport, that these other sports do have value as well, that you know, it's, it's very hard to hit a baseball, just as it's very hard to kick a football, just as it's very hard to you know, lean and steer on a bobsled or, or play hockey. I mean, any of these are very hard to do, but if you don't think about that, then you're kind of like, oh, well, my sport's hard, but yeah, anyone could go do that. And, and really that kind of brings the quality of, of the viewing experience down because people don't understand what goes into it. Right. And um, to, to answer your question, if yeah. I could, if if I could change anything. If you were king. Yeah, if, if I were king for a day. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, football, I'd say probably I wouldn't let kids play until they reached high school because you really don't learn anything by hitting as a youngster. You, you, know, you have to wait for your body to stop growing so you know what it's doing. Um, in college... I would take 80% of the money that's going to the NCAA, I'd funnel that right back into a fund for athletes so they have health care once they're done playing because college players are not paid. They go through the exact same risks that us and the pros go through. You know, we all had to go through the system. A lot of them get injured playing the game and they have no way of paying for that for, for the product that they've put out on the field later in life because they're not compensated. And then the pros, I do the same, the same thing. I'd carve out a 10% chunk of the revenue, 5% from players, 5% from owners, put that into a healthcare fund where if you play you know, a year, two years, whatever it happens to be in the NFL, you now have healthcare for life based on the things that you have gone through on the field. And yeah, a lot of guys won't need it, but a lot of guys do need it. And right now you're only covered for five years after you're done playing the game. And good luck trying to find insurance coverage after that because <laughs> wow. your body's been beat up pretty bad. <laughs> 
And of course, More than most five of the problems are later sometimes. developing, like whether it's joints or right. cognitive problems anyways. Right, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I'll chime in really quickly on the specialization yeah, sure. thing that Chris mentioned. So actually, because that's in my wheelhouse, and, and the vast majority of sports science data is saying that actually ultimate elite athletes go through a sampling period early on rather than specializing, and oh, people fine. who plateau at sub-elite actually usually specialize earlier. So like, since we're in Canada, I'll use the Steve Nash example. That's actually more typical, where he played a bunch of different sports. He wanted to be a soccer player through age 12, didn't get his first basketball until he was 13, eight years behind me, um, and became one of the most skilled point guards of all time, and that's actually the typical pattern. And so not just for ethical reasons or for raising your child, but actually for skill development. Mm -hmm. but, and so, Haley, as someone who has been in a summer and a winter Olympian, I'd be curious to hear both what you would change and what your development path was like. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with, uh, with you, David, on the early specialization. I, I just believe that the best athletes that I've ever seen in any sport, whether it's hockey, whether it's baseball, softball, um, are always great athletes uh, in other sports. They, you know, Wayne Gretzky you could probably play professional baseball. Sidney Crosby, same thing. Just Brendan Shanahan, lacrosse player. You go down the list, and these, you know, you put a frisbee in their hands, and they can throw it perfectly. They're just really good overall athletes, and I just really believe in that. I try to encourage. Um, families or parents to not put their daughter or son in hockey all year round. I think it's probably one of the most detrimental things that you can do and, and just try a lot of different things and who knows what you're going to be good at or what you're going to fall in love with. So uh, that I definitely agree with that. I think it's so important for young kids and the burnout factor is really high. Um, my son, 13 years old, was a competitive swimmer and they were asking for six days a week and uh, it was just too much time and mentally just too hard on these kids and I, I just really think there's different way that we can go about it. Um, as far as it just looking directly at women's hockey, I think that the grassroots coaching is a real issue and something we need to continue to develop and grow in the, in the female game, getting our best coaches to our youngest kids. And I really believe that in, if you look at a lot of the European models, uh, it's not looked, up, looked down upon that the master coaches in countries like Finland and Sweden would be paid a salary to coach the youngest children and to develop them. And in Canada, that's something that we don't have. You know, we look at our best coaches are coaching in the NHL or the national teams. They're not coaching the youngest kids, but I think it could be a reverse philosophy. So I definitely look at improving that and then continuing to push to, to grow a professional women's league because our game is really driven from the top down. And Steve, do you have a quick take on like, you know, the king for for the day? I, I love take? the idea of being king for the day of boxing. <laughs> um, I've, it's been four years since I've got to be king for a day for bobsled. Um, you know, bobsled's a unique sport where you can't do it growing up. Uh, the body, I mean, kind of like Chris said, the body's not meant for hitting and things like that at age, you know, until it develops through adolescence. Well, Bob says the same thing. You've got G-forces, uh, you know, a 15-year-old, a 14-year-old body would get crushed by five Gs going down a hill being shaken. So people don't really do this sport until they, they mature, you know, 17 or 18 is the earliest generally. Uh, you know, but to recap real quick, I think for us the biggest problem, our biggest issue is there's no money in the sport. So only the people that are at the Olympic medal, medalist level are getting some kind of stipend and funding and things like that. And what that does is it only leaves, it's, it's not fair, it only leaves like literally less than 10 people that are getting any kind of cash in the door to be able to do the sport. Uh, and you have these people who are, are sitting at the, you know, the cusp level who will go and, you know, who could go and do these great things for our country, but there's just no funding there. So I think trying to find some kind of injection that could be thrown in, I wouldn't want to see us catch Frisbees like Haley had said. Uh, we're not good at that. We are straight ahead. Um, but you take a box letter and they're going to be able to run a 40 and they're going to be able to do, you know, bench squat, vertical, all those things like anybody at the NFL Combine. Just don't ask us to go sideways. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all the time that we have today. Um, huge, huge thank you for um, Chris and David who are here today and also um, everyone from Skype. Uh, lots of questions to ask uh, across the entire landscape of professional sports. Um, lots of similarity, actually, yeah. um, as, as, as we learned today. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the video of this, of this is available on partners.tech.com. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks.